Wednesday, April 1st. I'm Rin. I'm Scott. And this is Geek Nights. Tonight, Collectible Gaming. Let's do this. All right, it's it's the April Fool's Day. Scott is really down on April Fool's Day. I don't understand well, why. Suddenly, suddenly I'm down on April Fool's Day. I'm down with April Fool's Day. No, because it, it thanks to, you know, when I was a kid, right, April Fool's Day was awesome because no one hardly ever did anything because, you know, little kids are afraid to do something and they didn't have the resources to really do anything. So, I mean. Well, you must have, my school was like, <laughs> uh, I don't even, it was like a war zone on April Fool's Day. Like, right. sometimes we just get the day off because they didn't want to deal with it. So, but I mean, like, you know, if you put chalk in the eraser, that was like, oh, man. <laughs> so, you know, having actual pranks in April Fool's Day, other than the ones we saw on TV and such, was like, you know, it would have been an amazing thing. So, you know, as I got older, like, anticipating there actually being pranks was, like, oh, so awesome. But now with the internets, right, it's like... People have forgotten it. They're not even pranking anymore. You know, I think, I actually, I think it goes back to the newspaper strip comics or on April Fool's Day, they would all sort of trade comics and like, you know, uh, the, the Peanuts guy would draw Garfield and the Garfield guy would draw Dilbert and, you know, they'd all mix well, it the, up. Well, the web comics all did that. People trying to read XKCD. Well, they didn't, no, they didn't. What they did is they said if you go to the one, they just basically changed all their DNS so one website goes to the other, goes to the other, yeah, goes to the other. Yeah, which is a really clever idea, I think. It's an okay idea, but it's not the same as drawing the other guy's comic. Which, actually, I think the Wondermark guy, he drew his comic instead of, uh, you know, photoshopping it as usual. But, I mean, those aren't pranks. That's just doing something silly. I mean, and that's, that's well and good, and sometimes it can be amusing. Uh, but it's not a prank. It's not, you're not making a fool of anyone. You actually have to make a fool of someone, or it doesn't count in the Book of Scott. Yeah, yeah, in the book is Scott, where nothing's a prank, and yet you never pull any pranks. I've never seen you pull a prank in your life. Yeah, because I, I'm not going to pull one if it's half-assed. I have, if I pull a prank, it's going to be so extravagant and so devastating. Yeah, we'll see. See, the thing is, to me, the best pranks aren't the ones that just publicly humiliate one person. They're the ones where you catch someone, and even if it's not apparent, they have that moment. It might even just be a second. Where they like go to the forum and see a thread that has a title of something. They go to a web page and the news is like R I A A disbanded. And it's April first. It's obvious it's a trick, but for that second before the rational brain kicks in and says, No, you're just a dumbass, they go, <gasps> and that second is what I live for. That second doesn't do anything for me. That second is just like a groan. It's like, ah, oh, you're so lame. I don't think anything does it for you anymore. Every, you think everything's lame? You're mad about everything? No, I think see, just... if there's a real April Fool's prank, right? You got to be running someone like all day, and at the end of the day, they're crushed. Like, yeah, and they, they like they want to kill themselves because you right, destroyed Scott, them so thoroughly. Put up or shut up. All right, I just, you know, you got to give me some years. It takes years to prepare something like that. I mean, that. actually, the, the French guy in my work was pretty good with all this. All he did was pull the classic French thing of, hey, there's a fish on your back. And he got everyone he pulled it on, except me, because I knew what it was. Yeah. Randomly. See, now, so, here's, here's the thing, he right? He was like, there's a fish on your back. And I'm like, yep. Last, like, oh. a, last April Fool's Day, I was fooled by a somewhat good prank of the Board Game Geek people, if you I know that Bark did almost the exact same yeah. prank. So that's actually approaching a good prank, right? Approaching? That was brilliant. It was okay. Uh, well, but, wait, wait. If that was okay, then what's great? I mean, a tire iron? No, that's not a prank. That's just outright. <laughs> See, now, what would be a great prank, right? Like it's a tire is, iron. Well, no, like if someone... Here's, a, here's one I just thought up, right? This is a pro... This is not a, a great prank, but it's getting closer to one. Is, is it the... Uh, da, 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 no, no, no. With our friend who was afraid of clowns. For example, someone gets to work and there's a message on their answering machine that's actually from a police station... Uh, talking about how their car has been broken into and then they go home early on the train and they go back to the parking lot and that's not a good prank that's just being an asshole no no and then right their car is there and they go what the fuck so they get in their car and then uh you know like something in the car like totally gets them like i don't know uh an inflating something or uh you know something that, like that. that that was like the worst prank ever that's, that's a just, great prank no it's not that's just being a jerk exactly and then, what do you think a prank is you no. make someone feel like a dumbass and you make their 
your life miserable no, pranks, and then you laugh at them. No, no, no. Pranks yes. are so much more subtle and clever than that. Nah. You got it. Uh, this is why you don't pull pranks. This is why I'm the prank man. No, you're the lame prank man. I, I prefer the more psychological pranks. No, it's a, a prank is all about laughing at other people's suffering. No, a prank is about knowing that you got someone out there, that someone went, oh, for that one second. That doesn't do anything for me. Nothing does anything for you. <laughs> yeah, well, laughing at people's suffering. <laughs> Great. <laughs> all right, so basically, though, despite me not being fooled by any actual April Fool's Day pranks today, I fooled myself. <laughs> Oh, really? Yes, I woke up, I turned on my computer and such, and I was like, it's April Fool's Day. Everything is bullshit. So I just, I wasn't going to read any web pages. I was going to fill my iPod and go, right? So I go to fill my iPod, and in the feed for the Roadhouse, the best blues podcast in the universe, right? It says Roadhouse Announcement. And I'm like, ugh, ugh, come on, man. And he, you know, he doesn't, you know, Tony, the Roadhouse guy, doesn't seem like the guy, kind of guy who would do pranks and whatnot, right? And, you know, before I even listen, I didn't even listen to it, right? I just, you know, synced my iPod, you know, from upstairs, you know? And then I, I just sent him an email, like, you're not fooling me with your announcement stuff. It probably says something like the Roadhouse is going to switch to being an 80s podcast instead of a blues podcast or something like that. Blah. All right? So I get on the train and I listen to it. And it's actually a totally serious announcement that was actually posted late on March 31st. Good job. So I got to work and I was like, oh, I am a dumbass. <laughs> 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 so, so in fact, I think... Uh, Scott, uh, th there's a fish on your back. Yeah. I think now, because April Fool's Day is just so obvious and so overbearing and so lame... That the way to really do April Fool's Day is to actually say something true that people are likely to disbelieve and thus they fool themselves. And in fact, one website followed the same philosophy, NewScientist.com, I think it is. Yes, NewScientist.com posted all stories that seem fake but aren't. And it's a really, really good idea. I like that action. Because people read these headlines like dinosaur killer found in volcanic bubbles, uh, China's boom sparks mass species invasion, wings with elbows. You know, they're pretty crazy. You know, if you actually read these stories, right, universe's tiniest black hole discovered, right? But they're all true stories. They just seem weird. Well, I remember actually last year, we, we got a lot of people, surprisingly, with a prank that we came up with at the last minute. We were like, all day, we're like, what are we going to do? Everyone does something on the internet. We got to do something, but we don't want to do what everyone else does because it's usually not that good, other than like what Board Game Geek and Fark did. And we can't do that. It's already been done. Yep. And you can't just Rick roll someone because whatever. Yeah, They're pretty much. I, I noticed, I saw it coming a mile away too. Everyone on the internet who wanted to do an April Fool's Day joke, right? But was lazy about it they all just did a rickroll youtube did a rickroll mahalo did a rickroll see now if i were youtube what i would or have done mahalo or whatever for, it's called for just today i would have redirected every possible link to my site to a rickroll all day <sighs> just that's what i would have so, done it's just so grown worthy it's like it's oh, great no it's not see to me the rickroll like Rick rolling someone itself is lame. It's obvious. It's blah. It's like, all right, you link to something, but it was actually a redirect to a Rick roll. Good job. But to me, the Rick roll doesn't symbolize that anymore. The proper use of a Rick roll is kind of like the modern equivalent of going, ha ha. It's like, you see that Rick roll? It doesn't mean I Rick rolled you. I'm just pointing out that I got you with something, and the Rick roll is merely the uh, means. You were tricked by <laughs> something else, not just a link, something beyond that. Mm. And the Rick roll is like, <laughs> yeah, but a lot of people today have been the Rick roll itself has been the trick, and it's not fun. a much better trick. Is it the is not amusing. Roll. It just makes me groan. Ah, Rick. Yeah, I think that actually what someone should have done is coming up with something. You know, they should have done the same trick as the Rick Roll, but coming up with something better than that video. Something else. Like, you know, perhaps some horrible two girls, one cup Rick Roll. No, that would actually, no, uh, no, yeah. No, no. Yeah, force people to watch that mother. It's 
because but that's still the same joke. It's just oh, you thought you were clicking on a link yeah, for but, one thing, but it was actually a link right, to something that's, unrelated. That's the first part of the joke. The second part of the joke is them vomiting because they're watching the vomiting and me laughing at them. God, you're like the worst prankster <laughs> ever. I can just see this now. Like, what if we, what if we like play the leak spin song in the background for like four hours until Scott Johnson freaks out trying to figure out what that song is before anyone else knew about the leak spin. And then we all laugh at him for like an hour after that. And then you're like, yeah. And then we fucking kill him <laughs> and bury him out back. No, you see, cause look, the original pranks, right? were all like, wait, wait, get... what original pranks? Like when Le Galois was <laughs> running around. <laughs> no, like you give someone the hot foot, you know, it's like, that's not a prank. <laughs> yeah, that's it is. being, that's criminal. I know it's criminal, but that's that's where pranks came from. The hot foot, the bucket of water on top of the door, that kind of stuff. That's funny action right there. I don't agree with your philosophy on pranks one bit. I like that kind of prank. I prefer the... I'll just point out that the Scott Johnson thing Spray is true. Spray someone with the hose in the middle of the winter. Wow. You know, surround their car with uh, big frozen blocks of ice so they can't drive it out. No, no, no. Much more clever <laughs> is to replace someone's car with a very similar car. That's a good one, too. But uh, anyway. And put their car on the other side of the school so they have to walk through a mile in the cold snow to get to it. No. Yes. No. Yes. Actually, to me, the best pranks are the psychological ones that last for months and you build up to some climax. <laughs> But the climax is sometimes so anticlimactic, like uh, like Penn's thing, where they had the friend who had the uh, gas efficient car, and he like it was a hybrid. And he's like, "Oh man, I got my hybrid. I'm saving the earth." So every couple of nights, they'd put like an extra gallon of gas. See, that in. was a good one because eventually he ran out of gas on the highway. No, that's <laughs> not it. <laughs> Because when they stopped filling his car with gas, he ran out. And then you laugh at his suffering of not having any gas in the See, car. See, that's not that bad. But your idea would be, and then the car blows up because of the pipe no, bomb. No, it doesn't need to blow up. You just need you just needs to run out of gas on the highway. Uh, I got to say, though, I'll say this on Tuesday because I don't want to say it on Wednesday. How come no one is... Acted like they're going to do a cosplay skit and then just rickrolled the audience. Why hasn't that happened yet? Because that, that's about to happen at every convention this year. It's we'll going to get played out. We'll see. I guarantee is, that at every anime convention, there'll be at least one cosplay that involves rickroll somehow. See, the thing is, just involving rickroll is Nick. Because remember, they make you do the like performance ahead of time. And you don't get to do your audio at real anime cons. You give it to the con ahead of time. And they play it over the speakers with no control from you during your skit. Right. There's no way for you, easily, to make the Rick Roll sound happen. Because the uh, the convention will hear it, which is, means you pretty much have to do a Rick Roll skit, and then the convention runners and the other cosplayers will know you're doing it, but no one else will. No, the, the best way is to either, one, have one man on the inside who does it, like, the guy who does the audio is the only one who knows. If you pay him off, that's a, that's a good trick. Yeah, or secret speaker. <laughs> Secret speaker is also a good trick. Of course, it's hard to overpower the sound system at some. Well, no, the sound system itself. You say my ours is a silent skit. Uh, yeah, that's how you do that. Good one. See, I, and then of course your version of that is, and then I bring out a tire iron and I kill the MC. Well, no, what I would do is I would, you know, I'd have some sort of right cosplay, right. And, you know, I'd have a bunch of people, but one person who is in the cosplay actually with us, you know, the rest of us would know everything that was going to happen and they would only know most of what was going to happen. And then maybe like cover them with paint or something. Paint. I don't know. Something. something God. You know. Remind me to never let you pull a prank ever. (laughs) God. Anyway, what do you got in the news? Ah, so... Being April Fool's Day was not easy to find real news. I mean, I could have just looked at yesterday's news. That's what I did. But I was lazy. Actually, I've been wanting to talk about this all week. Yeah, but anyway, there was one news that came out today that seems to be corroborated on multiple websites. So I'll trust this as a true news. Uh, The news says that Ubisoft, or Ubisoft, or whatever you want to call it, is going to put a lot of their games, such as the Assassin's Creed's and the Far Cry's, on Steam. And that's, you know, I guess it's a big news if you're a fan of those games. But really, what this says to me is something that I semi-predicted long ago, is that Steam is now becoming pretty much synonymous with high-end PC gaming. High-end PC gaming and Steam are like one and the same now. Microsoft games for Windows, and, you know, there, I guess there was some sort of attempt to sort of mix the Xbox Live and, and Windows Vista in some way, but that doesn't seem to be doing it. Steam seems to be where it's at, and... 
I really think, you know, since PC games are just not on the shelves at stores anymore, really, I think uh, Valve Steam is pretty much going to be the PC gaming source for the, still, uh, se- the foreseeable future. I, I I could see eventually, this is still, I think that what Steam, what they should do is sell Steam as an operating system. They should, they should. But the only problem with Steam is that it only runs on Windows PCs and not so much on Macs and Linux. And I... They're so avert. I guess it's so. A lot of the software is so heavily based in DirectX, you know, which is very. It, there's no blaming them for that because it is really easy to make high end 3D games in DirectX. Yeah, there's, there's other a problems too. This. Like a lot of people have said in the past, well, why don't you make like a virtual machine? Like it'll run on anything. And I've actually been dealing with VMware. Because that will you know, really hurt video card type performance action if you do that. Beyond all that. I, I've been actually working with some higher-up engineers at VMware and with other virtualization solutions, and I can tell you this, cl- timekeeping, and when I say timekeeping, I don't just mean your clock is accurate. I mean, like, the ticks. You cannot have accurate time. No accurate time means no video games. Yeah, pretty much. So, but really... That's the only thing wrong with Steam is it's limited to just Windows. And, of course, Windows is still number one in terms of numbers, so it's not a big problem. Yeah, but for now, there's, but there's really, trouble I mean, on the horizon. The Macs are getting crazy popular, right? Linux is, you know, more popular than it's ever been. It's, it's significant, even, you know, if it's not big. They could sell the Steam hardware. It's a Steam computer with Steam OS, and you can subscribe to periodic hardware updates. Yeah, the problem is that would be a lot of money. You see, that's that's the problem really with yeah, PC it, gaming it, is that a, a, a gaming PC is a lot of money, like that at least fifteen hundred dollars, right? Yeah. So if you're spending that kind of money and all it does is play games, you feel like a moron because for a lot less money you could have gotten a PS3 or an Xbox 360, which is still a lot of money, which just plays games and maybe does a few more things. So if you're paying out for a PC, you want it to still be able to do everything a PC can do because you're paying so much for well, it. Well, in Steam, you could run VMware to run Windows stuff. I guess they had to sell you a Windows license with your Steam. Or just, they could get, bra- I mean, what do you need nowadays? You need web browser, yeah. word processor, gaming. You don't even need word processor because you have Google Docs. Well, I'm, I'm talking about normal people, not cool people. Google Docs. Anyway. Yeah, plus until <laughs> Google Docs is fully integrated with Google Gears, I still need a word processor. They really got to integrate that Google Gears more. That's like, uh, but yeah, that's the only thing that's wrong with Steam. And other than that, it, Steam, in terms of PC gaming, I think that's it's where it's going to be at for a long time. And they've pretty much conquered the PC gaming world. Well, I mean, the thing is... I, every, it really, what let him do it, too, was that portal action. Because before then, Steam was really just a thing for all the Counter-Strike peoples, you know, and the Half-Life peoples. Well, and, remember, when Steam first came out, it sucked and was hated. It was awful. It was. It, well, it had problems. I never had problems with it, but a lot of other people did, and I won't deny that they Early did. Early on, when it came out, for a lot of people, it was basically unusable. Yeah. I'm like the only person who never had problems with Steam. Yeah, but <laughs> you, you also didn't play as many games as a lot of people. That's true. I mostly just played Valve's games and, and mods like Natural Selection, but... But, yeah, oh well. Well, speaking of Steam, I know you all know, I've bitched about this a bunch of times, but that they're updating Team Fortress 2. Now, part of this, if you notice, not many people are playing Team Fortress 2 anymore. That game did not win by any stretch. But uh, the thing that they've been saying they're going to go forward with is that they're going to have unlockable content, as in, if you get 20 achievements on the medic, you unlock extra medic guns. And this is coming closer to reality, and it looks like in a couple of weeks, we're going to see the first uh, bits of this. And I'm starting to worry, but not worry too much, because I tried to play Team Fortress 2 the other day, and I remembered, oh yeah, it's not the greatest game in the world. Yeah, yeah. Uh, I'm not. Really, I'm playing Smash Brothers now, and, in a, and then I'm going to be playing Mario Kart, and somewhere in there I'm getting the Rondo of Swords, so not so interested in uh, Team Fortress 2, really. But uh, I'll say this. Uh, my main complaint, my main worry was, all right, so you're going to let people with crap metagame stuff unlock permanent things they can use in-game that have an effect. So in this interview I found, someone asked a question. Quote, it was IGN, actually. If some players are running around with unlocked items and some aren't, how are you taking steps to assure that gameplay remains balanced between classes? They basically said, well, all the new weapons are mostly balanced with each other. 
Uh-huh. As in, it's all about options. You have more options, but they're balanced options. Like, instead of getting invulnerability, you get 100% crit rate. Great. And, yeah, I, I, I don't want to get into this. I've talked about this a bunch, but I think this is a crap move. And the worst thing is, they kind of ask him, like, so why are you doing this? And they basically talk about, how, well, this is the future of gaming, and this seems to be what people want. Well, you know, you look at it, right? And you look at numbers and sales and games that do have this sort of persistence or, you know, collecting Pokemon, World of Warcraft. Oh, yeah, it's great for making that's, money. That's where but... the money's at, so that's where everyone's going. And yeah. I think, you know, they made Team Fortress 2. They didn't have that stuff. Their game sort of, you know, I mean, I guess it did well, but it mostly rode on Portal. You know, no one, not really as many people are playing it as, you know, 10 years of waiting and the awesome style and all the hype and effort they put into it, you know, should mean. I mean, I don't have numbers, but looking at just what, so how many people are on what servers, uh, more people were playing Counter-Strike, more people are still playing Counter-Strike than were playing Team Fortress, even in some of its peak days. Yep. But uh, I don't want to talk about that. I don't want to talk about all these problems, but I point out that I've seen a couple of references to the fact that they're now going to start releasing more of those Meet the Whatever videos. I've seen multiple sources state that Meet the Scout is coming. Mm. And I realized what those were and why they made a few, and then they stopped making them. So I got a six-shooter, and I'm going to shoot Scott. You know, it's a prank. It's April 1st. It's a prank. I'm going to prank him. Yep. So I shot him twice in the head. Oh, man. Now, I could have kept shooting and emptied my gun. But I got these bullets, and he might die of those two gunshot wounds. So I'm just going to keep those bullets, and if the game does well, I don't need to even bother firing them. I can keep them for another day. But if the game starts to falter... Zombie Scott! Scott back from the grave! That's a, that's a good prank. Just <laughs> Ram sleeping at night, thinks I'm dead. Zombie Scott comes and eats his brain. Doesn't see it coming. I can start firing off more of those bullets. Now, the, the problem here is that... What I see, that it's kind of like my thing about Hillary Clinton. Now, the news I talked about last week wasn't a big deal in and of itself, but the kind of reading between the lines was that Hillary's campaign is stalled and this is like the last chance grasping at straws. Blah. I see Valve is going down the same route here with Team Fortress 2. They're grasping I, I at straws. I also see the same route. They're basically saying, shit, we spent a lot on this game. Portal was a success. Half-Life 2, kind of a success. Team Fortress 2, not the success you're hoping for. Let's do whatever we can to try to, you know, make it into something. But yet they're not doing what they need to do. I think the core problem with Team Fortress 2 was that it didn't actually target a demographic that exists. They on one, yeah. I mean, they tried to split two demographics. They wanted to be the, you don't need a lot of FPS skills. The console gamers can play it. It's pick up and run. It's simple. It's on the 360 and the PS3. And... That demographic would rather play Halo. Yep. And the other demographic is hardcore capture the flag people who've been waiting for this game forever. There's no capture the flag in Team Fortress 2 worth a shit. And they released a couple more maps, but by then all the hardcore people left. So no one plays those CTF maps. And what did they think to do and what are they doing now? Gold Rush. A totally new mode We have to walk a minecart past the enemies. That was always a good idea, I thought, was to have some sort of map where you drive a car, and then there's... It's you know, not like that. I know, and, and yet you, you had to sort of... Remember they made, uh, what was that one in Half-Life 1 with the with the vans, and the everyone got in the trucks? The well, home, there was just Jeepathon. Humvee. Yeah, Jeepathon, that's it. Jeepathon, Jeepathon 2K. Man, you know what? I realized something. Hardcore, like you can tell the hardcore FPS gamer, kind of like the hardcore anime fan. Playing Jeepathon was like watching Excel Saga. Like, if you're not already a fan of FPSs or already a fan of anime, that means nothing to you and is not fun. Jeepathon is like the best ha Counter Strike map ever. Jeepathon was like this broken ass map. With it was so busted. Ass vehicles. It, I remember driving up that ramp, and half the time you would just kill yourself. It you looked like shit. It was, it, but at the same time, it embodied that hardcore. It's like. It, it was, was the, um, it was art. It was art, and it was the same as the Ready Room and Natural Selection. I mean, in a way, right? The the, the vehicles in more modern FPSs, such as Halo and Unreal Tournament and such, are much better implemented than the vehicles in Half Life One. Yes, but, but there was something about the way Jeepathon worked, where that is the absolute best. One guy drives the Humvee, and three guys sit in the Humvee shooting out the windows at the other people in the other Humvee shooting out the windows. 
game that has ever existed. And uh, I mean, also, like, remember the APC? Oh, now, on, on Assault? Or it wasn't Assault, was it? It was one of those rare, I mean... The one where you have to break into the base over the bridge. And but the, yet, half the time, you get in the APC and you start driving, and... What the hell was that map called? That map doesn't exist anymore, No, it doesn't. Really. But half the time, you'd get in the APC, and the driver would just back it up against the wall so none of you could get out, and then jump up and down on top of it until the enemies came and grenaded you to death. <laughs> that, was, that was awesome. <laughs> <laughs> it was a thing of beauty. But it was more that, like, the community around the game would support that kind of meta, barely gaming, more like collaborative uh, experience. It's hard to explain what was good about that. And I'm not claiming that that was great in terms of gameplay by any stretch. But Team Fortress 2 didn't really capitalize on that. And they didn't capitalize on the hardcore FPS capture the flag. And which was like the basis of why I was looking forward to that game. And the lack of it was the reason I stopped playing. Though I can say this. I played over the weekend for like 20 minutes. I joined a random server. It was 15 on 15. Like one of those big old in an awesome map. And it, the game had been going for like 20 minutes. No time limit. No sudden death. And it was zero to zero. I just turned into a scout and captured the flag three times. Yeah. Immediately. Sounds about right. Yeah, I, feel, I that was bragging, but I feel proud about that. Because the problem is a lot of people who play that game, the way they play is they say, I want to do this role. So they pick the role they want to do, say sniper, and then you just sit there and snipe, and then they don't do anything else. They don't think about the flag. They don't think, And then someone else says, I want to be the engineer. So they sit there, and they set up their thing, and they maintain it. And that's all they do. Now, and that because that's sort of that World of Warcraft style of play. I want to be the healer. You just sit there and you pay attention to your little healing, and you just heal as best you can. You don't think about the big picture, or winning the game, or anything like that. You just now, sitting there doing busy work. That's fine for games that kind of. I mean, for World of Warcraft, like you want it, letting everyone do exactly what they want to do works. But for a game like Team Fortress, it works for the casual gamer. It doesn't work for the hardcore gamer. So all the hardcore FPS people didn't even bother with the game, and all the casual people left. And the, the thing I really want to point out at the end of this interview, because this is a question, this says everything. Question, will the console versions ever see these updates? No. Answer, we're still trying to figure that out. Yep. Right now, we're working on a map pack that we hope will contain Gold Rush and the rest of the maps we've shipped to the PC customers so far. Yeah, map pack they can do. They've done map packs on the 360 before, so there should be no reason why they can't do one now. But anything else, I don't know if they're going to be able to do that. <laughs> Maybe some sort weekend. of on a disc. I think we need to set up some sort of all the old school FPSers versus the rest of the forum on uh, Team Fortress 2 on a private server. How are we going to tell who's the old school and who's not? I think we'll, we'll do the Turing test. One by one, we'll, we'll, you'll like, we'll chat with each of you individually, and I'll, we'll be that's able to you, tell. That's all you. I don't have time for that. Pretty much, it's, have you ever played any of the following games? Action Quake 2. Counter-Strike 1.6. Yeah. <laughs> Weapons Factory. I tried to play some Counter-Strike 1.6 last week, and just as the getting was good, everyone quit. Ah. Like, I sucked because I, I haven't played the game in years, but I was getting it back, and then everyone quit. But there's yeah. one guy obviously cheating, so the, va the, 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 the VAC thing is not uh, up to snuff, really. It's still possible to cheat, apparently. Anyway, things of the day. So, you know they were coming. And I love the fact that now we have the YouTube generation and we can see them right away. I don't know. The thing is, though, how come the YouTube generation doesn't know how to use the freaking video out of their Wii? I don't know. Why was every video They don't have of capture this... cards. Uh, but, uh, uh, anyway, th there's so many ways to do this. If you have a camera, kid... Oh, this is not an April Fool's Day, by the way. If you have a camera, kid... All right. Cameras always, almost always, video cameras also have a video in on them. A lot of them do. So you could have just, pl uh, anyway. So this video, this is the best one out there. There's a glitch that has already been found in Brawl. Well, you remember Smash Brothers Melee had a glitch with the black hole. It had a couple of glitches. The black hole was my favorite one by far. But this glitch is basically, so if you take Jigglypuff, there's a couple of things. I don't think people have figured out all of the things that will do this yet that will cause him to double in size suddenly and permanently. Well, you mean using his final smash makes him, like, grow. No, no. 
Well, it, it's complicated. This final smash makes him grow, but there must be some sort of kind of like how if you add a bold tag and forget to unbold it, or you add an unbold tag, but there's no bold tag in front of it. Like, mm -hmm. or you have a paren that opens something, but you forget to have the close paren. So now you've got like all these parens that are out of sync mm -hmm. if a certain thing happens. Something like that must have happened with Jigglypuff because if you interrupt his, his final smash in any way, or if you cancel it and then certain things happen, you'll double in size. Well, if you, use it, if you do it with the final smash, it looks like he'll remain at final smash size. But, but there's another trick with Yoshi that will double his size. So this video outlines both of those, and then they do what all, you're all thinking. What if I combine them? And the answer is, it doubles the size, whatever the size may be. So when he's, if, he, if you make a Jigglypuff really small and then do the trick, he'll be the same size small, but times two. If you... So if he already takes up half the screen and then you do the trick, whoa now. Yes. Now, the, the, the interesting thing to note is that it appears that double size Jigglypuff is absolutely useless and furthermore is no more powerful than any normal Jigglypuff. Yeah. But this is really cool and really awesome, and I love the fact that kids find these things and post videos of them. If anyone can pull this off in, like, a tournament, like, for reals, you're the win. Man, I would I would collaborate with other people. like And a team tournament, get Yoshi-Jigglypuff combo, and then, you know, just make just a Or collaborate with a bunch of people and be like, if we face each other, let's do it. Uh, kind of like those two guys in that ping pong tournament who had that one round of just crazy hilarity. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Just like that. But anyway, what do you got for me? Okay, so, you know, back in the day, there's a kind of game to play on the web, right? Where, you know, I mean, lately the big thing has been Flash games, tower defense kind of stuff, right? That's well and good. But there's a style of web game. It's actually a style of game that's been around since the BBS days, where it's a game that you sort of check in on once in a while. Like, the game is sort of always going, but it goes very slowly. So imagine, like, an RTS where your guys walk real slow. Well, you can walk away for a minute for like a few hours and come back and walk away and come back. And since it's so slow, you just sort of, when you come back, you sort of do all your stuff and then you walk away and you can, you know, you can even forget about it for a day or two and then come back and it's still okay. You know, you can't get killed so instantly because everyone else is going really slowly also. And basically, there's a website I found, Ecarium, I think, it, or Icarium. I, I don't know how to correct pronunciation, but it's I K A R I A M dot org. And it's basically a simplified version of civilization, but, you know, played on the web, and you only have to check in like once or twice a day, maybe, and you'll be just fine. I played a game like this, and so did Scott and everyone else in the crew. At RIT, it was this, some sort of wizards, and you build this a little... one. That one was pretty much just like you have ten knights, you know, and he just had the word knights and the number ten. Gaga. This one actually looks like Civilization. There's graphics and the user interface and the the whole thing, and it's really slick and it's free. There's a there's a mode you can pay for, like I carry them plus, but I, I'm not paying for that. Uh, and we're on, I'm on the Zeta server, so everyone who I told already followed me to the Zeta server. I chose the Zeta server at completely arbitrarily. So if there's actually a difference between the servers, we can, you know, maybe fix that or something. But our plan is to make a giant alliance on the Zeta server and conquer the whole server, at least as much as possible. Hmm. We'll see. That'll probably take a while. My current short-term strategy is basically I'm upgrading my academy and nothing else and trying to get all the science. So once I get all the science, then I'll be able to, like, just upgrade my place crazily to full-on and then build a giant army and slowly conquer everything near me. That's my, that's my strategy for the... Uh, the I have yet to even look at this game. I, I didn't have time. I was actually working at work. Yeah, you may, or, you may or may not enjoy it. You know, this is the kind of thing where I'll probably log into it in the morning. And I'll admit... Log into it maybe at lunch and log into it, you know, maybe I mean, don't, when I get home. Don't misplace my eye. I haven't tried it yet with cynicism. I love games like this. Yeah. It just most of the games like this aren't always that good, but the thing is, it's not, the investment I, is so little. Yeah. There are already some problems with it that I'm that I'm starting to detect and that, you know, they're pretty much I'm not going to get into it now, but this is, you know, it's it's at least going to occupy, you know, the the uh the attention of some people's for at least 
a few weeks, uh, I'm assuming. So get in it while, uh, strike while the iron's hot. Well, actually, say. I played that mage. It was like the Ascension or something. I forget what it was exactly. I think I might have played something called Anarchy, but I don't remember. All I remember is that I decided to be like white magic, and I was, I was very defensive. And my people were prosperous. And my goal was not to expand or engage in like the crazy PvP, but to expand slowly and moderately and, and just have this gigantic, perfectly stable, utterly defensible kingdom. And then I found out that they periodically just reset the game and make everyone start over, and then I just quit. No, oh, screw that shit. Yeah. If I'm going to have a persistent world, I want a persistent goddamn world. Uh, yes, yeah, that is one thing, is that this is sort of like, it's civilization, but every, you know, every city and town is owned by someone. If you attack, someone's going to, you know, come home at night, log in for five minutes, and they're going to see Scott is attacking you, and they're going to be like, that fucker. Also, the, the, the way of doling out resources and time and that sort of thing, in general, I'd like to do a show on game mechanics or like different collaborative or multiplayer game mechanics, because... This is one very underutilized mechanic that has great promise. Like, good God, could you do awesome things with this idea? But mostly people have made very simple games so far. Yep. All right, you want to get on with the show? I think we can. All right. So you have a little more venom in you than me about this. So you can introduce the I topic. I do have some venoms a, a bit, basically. I have a little more venom because I think I invested a lot more time and money into these things than you. Maybe, but so, I invested quite a bit of time and money. I got the box of cards to prove it under my bed. Yeah, yeah. I, I don't know. My box of cards is in Arizona, far enough away to where I'll never be tempted to play it again. Yeah, I'm, I'm never going to be tempted anyway. Basically... We're, we're going to talk about collectible games now, not in general. Just Magic not, the Gathering. Now, collectible card games are, are the most popular subset. We're going to talk about collectible games in general here. Uh, we'll probably do another show on mad, just Magic itself in the future. But we'll, we'll be using Magic as an example quite often, but also other things. Now, what a collectible game is, is it's a game just like any other game. You know, just like Puerto Rico or anything. Except, the pieces of that game, you have to collect them. So imagine... If you were going to play, say, collectible chess, right? Uh, but everyone wasn't just always playing with the same chess pieces every time. You know, one guy who was wicked rich went out on eBay and bought a full set of queens. And he just all queens. Everyone else is playing with, like, mostly pawns. And, like, maybe they were lucky and they had, like, one queen and a few bishops, you know, and, may and, and such. That's what a, a collectible game is. It's now, where I just want to point out that we because we have to make this clear right away because... There are games that are like this that are not actually collectible games. They're a completely different kind of game. Yes, for example, uh, take Magic the Gathering, right? It is a collectible game. When you buy cards, at least the official way, you're buying them, you know, sort of randomly, you know, and, you know, there, there is a, I guess, collecting market and a collector's value to the cards and such, you but know? But what if you and all your friends each bought one revised set, one dark set, and one legend set? Everyone had the exact same list of cards, and then you created decks and fought with each other. Well, that's just a customizable game, you see, because everyone is playing with the same set. I mean, let's say we're playing customizable, uh, you know, collectible chess, right? But we agree that, all right, er, you know, we look at every, what everyone has managed, you know, what chess pieces everyone has managed to collect, and we say, all right, everyone, uh, you know, you, you can have these sets of pieces and then make, you know, pick whichever ones you want from these yep. so no one can make a full set of queens even if they own them because we're gonna you know arbitrarily limit you in, in this case so in that case you can actually preserve and have a good customizable game where people can customize what they're using to play the game but it's still not the the influence of it being collectible doesn't ruin the game part now the smart kids who play magic i don't know how it is now because there's so many cards that i got the the fact that Magic is still going and that they have actually plotted out every expansion that's going to be released through like 2012, when I guess they didn't go beyond that because that's when Quetzalcoatl is going to kick everyone's ass. Right. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, the uh, the game is fucking Magic. Yeah. All right, so but, there... but, 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 the, but the smart kids did. I lost my train of thought. I was trying to cover <laughs> that up. But was that what I did, what a lot of us did, is we would take land and we'd write Mox Emerald or Black Lotus on them. And we'd still follow the rules for creation. But if we didn't own a card, we would do that so that we could play with these cards. Because otherwise, the rich kid who bought Great Wall of Magic, which literally was just every wall ever released in Magic up to that point, I also ended up acquiring that at some point because uh, mm -hmm. God was stupid. And uh, 
That was also before the internet, where you couldn't just look up all the all awesome old cars. You had to get Scry Magazine to get... Wait, uh, I don't, uh, that's a whole show in and of itself. Yes. Remember Magic the Conquering? No. Oh, it was a... It basically was a way to play Magic on a board where you moved the creatures around. Uh, I didn't play that. Uh, but there are other sorts of collectible games like that don't have this problem. For example, take uh, Warhammer, right? Warhammer is collectible, you know? But the thing is is you know exactly what you're buying. You go to the store and you say, I want five of those and ten of those. Now, the thing is, there's still a, a matter of having enough money to play the game, but more money doesn't mean more winning. Well, you know? it does <laughs> if you can't afford the pieces you want. Well, yeah, that's true. It's more that there's no limit of supply. I mean, it's not like magic where, well, you can't get a Black Lotus. There aren't any in your town. Yeah. or in The thing is... A game like Warhammer is actually a good game all around. It's just because it's somewhat collectible, not randomly collectible but like Magic, but collectible in a way, it's a very expensive game. So basically, if you have a lot of money, it's a good game and you can play it. But if you don't have a lot of money, you probably shouldn't play it because I mean, you can it just costs too much. Pieces of cardboard with, you know, things written on them. But oh, I, yeah, yeah. I'll say this. Trying to play a war game like that, you might say, hey, the pieces are just fluff. They just like add color to the game. That's like saying, yeah, graphics are just fluff. You don't need graphics in a game. And then in, imagine if Half-Life 2 looked like Doom. It wouldn't have been as immersive or good a game. War, Warhammer and all that, I'll, I've tried to play those games with just pieces of cardboard, and it's just not nearly as engaging. Yeah. And if you're going to go Battle, with it, Battle tech you can play, but you, even then you can't get too big a game going on or, or else it becomes unmanageable without real pieces. Yeah, but... I don't know how much we have to say about what's wrong with collectible games because it comes down to, basically, if you spend money, you can just pretty much make a better thing and, or a be have a better chance of winning. It adds this whole meta element. Your Factors affect the game that have nothing to do with the game itself. There's kind of this real-world game of collecting now. Mm -hmm. See, there is an additional thing, though, is that it is true, a lot of people say that, like, oh, it's not just whoever has the most money wins. Well, and in Magic is, it was. What? In Magic, it was. In Magic, in the early days, it was. But now, it's it's really not. I mean, Bill Gates could just buy every Magic card ever, but he probably still won't beat, like, world champions because he doesn't, you know, know how the game works and he doesn't know how to play. But what he, if you hired someone else to make a deck for him? The strategies are pretty they would, simple. They used to sell on, you know, sets. They'd be like, this is the deck the champion used last year, you know? And, like, you could buy, this, you could buy two of those, give one to your friend, and play against each other. You know, and it still would come down to be who was better. So, well, the, the, it depends because and randomness because it is a game of drawing cards out of a deck. There is a lot of randomness. There's also other troubles in that the reason they were able to keep Magic going like that was that they kind of had different kinds of tournaments. I mean, when I stopped playing Magic seriously, a Type Two tournament meant you could use revised Fallen Empires. And the dark. Yeah, when I played, a t I went to one Magic tournament, and then I stopped playing Magic forever. <laughs> um, the Type 1 tournament was like, you can use anything almost, except for banned cards and whatnot. See, right? that for me already, that was, type, like, that was Type 0. And then Type 1 was you can use everything except these restrictions. Yeah, Type 2 was like, you can use... Fourth edition and you know any you know new cards, but and that are basically you could use still in print and available cards that well, the, normal people could get. I, I'm sure they've changed, but the rules. Oh, I'm sure to, a lot of things have changed. But the actual type two rules used to be you can use the most recent normal base set and the previous two released uh, expansion sets, and that's it. Uh huh. Yeah, I don't know. The thing is, is that collectible gaming. It sort of has, you know, I've done a collecting rant on the show before. I don't know what episode it was. I could do it again in the future, perhaps revise it in some ways. But basically, you know, when I was a kid, uh, my dad would, you know, occasionally bring home, like, you know, some baseball cards or something, you know, and it, it was fun. I liked it when I was a kid. And then, uh, like, I sometimes I get, like, a sticker book. Where you get, like, a book, and you get a pack of stickers, and the stickers are on cards, and, like, each card had two stickers. So it was, like, a pack of cards, but really it was, like, a whole bunch of stickers, and you'd put them in the book, and you would try to fill the whole book. And, you know, it was it was sort of fun. And, like, I had, like, a little collect. I wasn't, like, a super collector when I was a kid, you know, but, you know, I liked to put, like, the baseball cards in order, had a little bit of OCD action going on, you know, like... 
I, I, I had a green binder, a blue binder, a black binder, a white binder, wow. a gold binder. Wow, you went all out. I just have a box. I still have the same box. I used The that. cards were organized by type and then within type alphabetically. Uh, you went way more than I did. I just sort of, you know, organized them by color, green, white, red, blue, black, in order of how much I liked the color. The fact that I needed the gold binder because I had enough gold cards from, like, Legends and all yeah, that. Yeah, I didn't have that many cards. Uh... And then I would sort of do it like by uh, I do like by type, and then sort of by how good I felt they were. Like if I like my my force of nature would sort of be in the front of the green creatures, you know, and like the like the shitty one one green creatures would be in the back, you know, and then the forests, and then the white cards and such. But yeah, you know, I had little OCD kind of action when I was a kid. You know, I, I'd collect the comic books. You know, I had, sort of had to get all the issues and I keep them in order and such and everything. You know, I used to collect X Men cards, but I didn't I, go, keep... I have a lot of X Men cards under my bed. I really like those superhero cards. Yeah, you know what? As those are I, actually really good. As much as I hate superhero comics, I actually did like those cards a lot. And this, I still have mine. Yeah, superhero cards. You know, while collecting them was kind of you know that was a problem. Hey, does anyone want to buy a full set of the uh, foil? Uh, special reprints from the Wolverine season or series two. Yeah, because <laughs> I don't need them anymore. <laughs> you could probably eBay that shit. Yeah, maybe I could. Maybe. Um, but actually, the you know the, the some of those cards, you know, they they didn't do anything, right? But they had sort of like an entertainment value. Like you would read the text on the back and you would look at the art. I remember trying to like you know trace the superheroes off of the cards to try to learn how to draw them and stuff. You know, there was there was some merit to them, at least a little bit. You know, not much. But then as I grew older, I sort of realized, you know, around the time when I was actually began spending my money on these things and not someone else's money, <laughs> that, you know, collecting was really dumb and a waste of money <laughs> and, and a waste of time. <laughs> and it was pretty much just getting enjoyment from owning something, pretty much the height of materialism and consumerism and such. And really what I wanted to do was play. And I realized... We, we, you know, when I look back at what I had done with Magic the Gathering, I had done a lot more collecting Magic the Gathering than playing. Like, I spent a lot of time, like, sitting around my room, play, looking at the cards, reading them, yep, sort, yep. sorting them. I spent, a lot, I spent a lot more time, like, designing decks and designing decks yep. and designing decks, but I never could play with those decks because the decks always needed cards I didn't have. Yep, and reading magazines, reading... I, had a, I have a little book. I still have the book, like, How to Win at Magic. I'd go to conventions and try to, like, trade. Man, that was a time when you could I had a few barter. friends I would play with, but we didn't play well... And I never had, you know, the cards I really wanted to play well. And I went to that one time I went to that tournament, right? I had a deck like planned. Like I had this clever idea. I thought I was so clever when I was a punk, stupid kid. Right. And I made this little deck and I got it pretty close, you know, with the money I had, you know, because that was pretty much the only time I was able to buy cards individually. It was at that little tournament place. And then I went and I played, and I just got hosed by someone who actually knew what they were doing. Man, I designed this awesome deck. It was basically, I called it the Annihilator. Uh, we'll save that for the magic show, but that deck was like the best fucking deck ever. Yeah. So, you know, I sort of, that died out. And then in college, you know, we, we were playing the battle tech and they came out with this mech warrior mage knight, you know, the clicks thingies. Well, oh God, I re all I remember is that everyone else in the front row crew and all of our like tertiary friends, not were like, everyone, almost everyone was like, hot shit, check it out. Oh my God. And I took one look at it and said, that game is shit. It's mostly random. It's not a game. Look at it doesn't, it's not even Battletech. They just happen to have mechs on them. It's just numbers that you click. It's nothing. Yeah, and I well, was like the only one who didn't play it. I had it. played I the... believe Scott himself called me stupid and bought into this thing. <laughs> well, I, was like, I admitted I was wrong in yeah, the end. Yeah, but there were like, I remember multiple times, he'd be like, man, Rim, you're missing out. I was playing with Luke and Greg. And, that, and then like a week later, he's like, yeah, I'm done with that game. Yeah. Basically, the, the thing is, with the clicks games, the clicks games are actually, it's not a bad functional idea, right? You play a tabletop, you know, miniatures war game, right? Except the pieces click and sort of the, as they take damage, you can actually click the pieces. You don't have to like keep track on a piece of paper and it's, it's much less finicky and it's, it's, it's a pretty good idea. The thing is the way they sell those games, right? Like the hero clicks and the mage knight and the whatnot is you're trying to collect the pieces, and some are better than others. <laughs> They're just better. And, you know, we actually played the MechWarrior game quite a few times because we had a lot of people going in on it, and it was sort of, 
you know, that collecting bug like came and bit me again. And I was like, you know, if I had 10 more bucks, uh, it was a little hard to resist not buying a few more. Yeah, but then you realize. Hoping that there would be an awesome mech in the, in the next little box I bought. But then you realize that there was actually no strategy in the game other than have your tanks next to your mechs. Yeah, I mean, then I actually kept playing the game enough and I fully realized, you know, after a few plays, wow, there's real, this isn't really, a, a, you know, it doesn't matter what my strategy is. It's pretty much just, uh, it just kind of happens and it's not a good game. And even if it was a good game, it was still, you know, the collectible aspect of it, you know, also hit me like, wow, if I just had better mechs, I would win even if my strategy was a lot dumber and even if strategy mattered. And that was like the final nail in the coffin for the collectible games for me. And I sort of went back, and now I only play non-collectible games. Thing is, customizable games are awesome. Are still good, and it's it's the it's the thing is a customizable game in its very nature. I think Stratego is a customizable game. Yeah, we right? both have a set, and there's a set of rules for putting your things onto the board and what you want to do, and then we play. Yep. By the way, I punked Scott over the weekend. I won one out of three, which is and the thing is, when you play a customizable game, right, collectible or not. There is a rock, paper, scissors element to that. In Stratego, the rock, paper, scissors is very strong. We've done a show on Stratego, right? Yes. Okay. In Magic the Gathering, at least when I played it, the rock, paper, scissors was pretty strong. Oh, I God, mean, it was. If you had, uh, you know, COP red and the other guy had a red deck, that's rock, paper, scissors, I win. I mean, come on. That's why I had the sideboard full of COPs. <laughs> that, that was one strategy, was the sideboard full of COPs. I had of course, side- I remember when I played at a, I played at tournaments for so long, and I played at a non-tournament. I was at a friend's house. We played the first game, and then I was like, all right, I'm swapping four cards in my sideboard. He was like, fuck you, no sideboards. And I was like, what? Sideboard? And then he punched me. Yeah, see, and- me and all my friends, we, you know, we all read, like, the, you know, the magazine. So we sort of knew the tournament rules and played with them, thinking we were all smart. And then uh- at the tournament, the rules were actually different because we were the dumbass punk kids were behind the times nah. with, with no internets. But- see, actually, I mostly, we had a lot of fun playing Star as opposed to anything else. Yeah, yeah. Uh, I think we're done. I think we said all we need to say about collectible games. They're kind of poop. Yeah, collectible games, not good. Collecting in general, not so admirable. Well, not so exciting. Yeah, not really. It's it's not worth the money. You can get a lot better gaming without collecting. There are a lot better ways to spend your money besides collecting. Even if you're profiting from your collecting, there's probably, with all that time and effort you put into that, you could probably be making more money with a job. It's... It's really just bad that so that collectible type things have eaten up and the collecting bug has eaten up so much of geekery. But yet, I and mean, it's caused a lot of side effects in other areas of geekery. Look at anime. He's, like no one there you know, aren't many anime tchotchke collectors anymore. And how many people actually still play magic? Well, the thing is, like, look, collectible gaming has done significant damage to actual sort of be- quote better gaming. You know, I mean, if there wasn't any collectible gaming, they, you know, at one hand, it brought a lot of people into gaming. And See, at the same time, that, that argument reeks a little bit of what I heard a lot when Magic was super popular. And Dungeons & Dragons people were basically saying, Ah, Magic is ruining. I try to run my game, but everyone just wants to play Magic instead. And they all have their decks out. And blah, 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 blah. And I'm just whining because actually I'm a crappy DM and my players are bored. And that's why they're playing Magic. Yeah, that's Listen the, to me. There Listen is, to me. There is an aspect. I'm not talking about... girls there I want to do that. I'm not talking about it on the on the you know the human individual level. I'm talking about on the industry level. You know, the gaming industry has has moved in a certain direction because of the popularity and the money it can make in the collectible games. The video game industry has moved in a certain direction because of, you know, the MMOs. We just saw that in your in your uh, news with, you know, Valve and such, right? The 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 comic book industry has moved in a certain way because there are people collecting comic books as opposed to just caring about reading them. That's why you see the same comic book come out with three different covers because they know that some nerd will buy all three covers and they can make more money off of him. And, you know, collectible gaming is, is damaged gaming in that same way. And, yeah, it's not the happiest thing. And I really... Even if there's a really good collectible game, I do not suggest that anyone play it unless... It's if it's really good. If it's really good, buy a bunch of complete sets or enough cards. Yeah, like we tried to do that with the Penny Arcade game. We just bought one set and we played it. It was a terrible game. That's which- like what that, I think that is in terms of dollars spent per unit bad, the best deal ever if you like bad games. <laughs> if you like bad games, yes, buy the Penny Arcade collectible card game and basically it's it's 
fair, and it, it's a terrible game. And I went, it, we did a show on it, didn't we? Yes, we did. A long time ago. All right, I think we're done. We're done. This has been Geek Nights with Rim and Scott. Special thanks to DJ Pretzel for the opening music. Be sure to visit our website at www.frontrowcrew.com where you'll find show notes, links, our awesome forum, a link to our Frapper map, and links to all the RSS feeds. We say feeds plural because Geek Nights airs four nights a week covering four different brands of geekery. Mondays are science and technology. Tuesdays, we have video games, board games, and RPGs. Wednesdays are anime, manga, comic nights. And Thursdays are the catch-alls for various rants and tomfoolery. You can send us feedback by email to geeknights at frontrowcrew.com. Or you can send audio feedback via Odeo. Just click the link that says send me an Odeo on the right side of our website. If you like what you hear, you can catch the last 100 episodes in iTunes or in your favorite podcatcher. For the complete archives, visit the website, which has everything. Geek Nights is distributed under a Creative Commons Attribution Non-Commercial Sharealike 2.5 license. This means you can do whatever you want with it as long as you give us credit, don't make money, and share it in kind. Geek Nights is recorded live with no studio and no audience. But unlike those other late shows, it's actually recorded at night.